Hi folks and welcome to Poverty Proof, how the rich think differently and how you can train your brain for wealth. Today we're going to do something very unusual. We're doing a channel crossover. Our introduction goes like this. There's a strange new phenomenon that is destroying businesses and destroying careers and it's called cancel culture. It's part of this idea of deplatforming certain voices and it's been extremely detrimental to certain business owners, entrepreneurs and career builders. Now of course this is an ideological issue and it really does pertain to my second channel which uh, if you if you would like to have a look is called Breaking Woke. It's written as one word Breaking Woke, it's a YouTube channel and there's a website called breakingwoke.com. Our link between these two ideas is an unusual one. It's essentially the idea that this can destroy your business or your career and that is a poverty issue. However, it is political and ideological in nature, so if that's not your bag then the rest of this video isn't going to be for you. Don't worry, we'll have more coming very soon. However, if that type of content does interest you, the flaws, fallacies and dangers in politically correct thinking, then won't you please join that channel as well. It's written as one word, Breaking Woke, and please do subscribe. It relates to a new book that I have coming out next month called Political Correctness Does More Harm Than Good. If you have read any of my books on poverty uh, and on building personal wealth, you'll have encountered this trend in my thinking. The differences between the politically correct cosseting but false answers versus the harder but true answers, the ones that genuinely help people out of poverty. So with that we're going into a second introduction and this will be the version of the video that appears on that site. It'll go like this. <clears throat> Hi folks and welcome to Breaking Woke where we identify, debunk and dismantle dangerous ideas. Where did this new cancel culture come from? This idea of deplatforming people. This is a relatively new development in human history. It's not something that was part of our civilization even as much as say 10-15 years ago. And it has become quite extreme. It's this idea of attacking a person's business, attacking a person's career, getting people fired for political wrong think. It's all very Orwellian and quite troubling. Well it turns out that there actually is a history to this one and I've traced it and it's fascinating and I believe you need to know it. We saw such a bad example of this one in my nation just last week. There was a guy who made a, let, let's be honest here, a severe social media faux pas. He said a few things that deeply offended people. Now of course the reality of the thing is in any free speech environment you're allowed to say things that offend people. You might be right, you might be wrong, that's not really the issue here. What was interesting to me is the response. It became this hate swarm. Now folks, I'm up for a rigorous debate. That's something that I actually quite enjoy. And perhaps I was blessed with a fairly thick skin. I don't particularly care what strangers think. But not everyone is built this way. In this particular case, I watched good, sane, sound of mind, fairly rational and even quite moral people forming this hate swarm around the topic. Now it's one thing to call a person an asshole and aim various expletives in their direction and I prefer a well expressed argument but you know if you can't articulate yourself well by all means go that route. You, you are actually allowed to. But it went further than that. I watched people say because I'm offended I hope that this guy has his career wrecked, that he isn't able to feed his family and that he kills himself. Now. I'd love to tell you that I'm joking or that I'm exaggerating there, but I watched people say, I hope his business is ruined, I hope he never earns again, I hope he starves and I hope he kills himself. Folks, a serious question. Do you genuinely hope for that? If that man actually commits suicide, will you rejoice? I feel that if you do, we can't be friends beyond that point because there's something evil about that. Whatever happened to this idea of I may not agree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. These days it's become, doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, if I'm offended by what you say, I hope you destroy yourself, I wish death upon you. <laughs> I'm reminded of that scene from The Lord of the Rings. Do not be too eager to hand out death and judgment, Frodo Baggins, for even the very wise cannot see all ends. And it's just not something that we do. Even your worst ideological enemy, call them names if you have to, better articulate a good argument against them but for heaven's sake we don't wish death on anyone. That, that is a bridge too far and there is something profoundly evil about it. Please, that's my appeal to you. 
So where did this come from? It actually does have a history and it's a fascinating one. It comes from a man named Herbert Marcuse. Have you ever heard of him? Herbert Marcuse is perhaps one of the worst things that ever happened to the American academic curriculum. He started out as part of what was called the Frankfurt School with poisonous characters like Adorno et al. And this was a, a school of thought that moved from the European mainland to the United States of America after the war. They had a goal. Their goal was to overthrow Western civilization for communism. That's what they wanted. So that's our starting point. Now, the Frankfurt School has a great deal to answer for in terms of what we see going wrong in civilization today. They were, in many ways, the genesis of some of the worst poison that we're seeing today. Okay, so here's the goal of the school. Their goal is to overthrow Western civilization and to replace it with Marxism. They wanted communism. That was the point. That was the goal. So Herbert Marcuse was a part of this project. They had an interesting problem on their hands, having found themselves in the United States in a period in which that nation was experiencing prosperity unprecedented in human history. They realized that the Leninist Marxist predictions of the failure of capitalism were not going to happen organically. So their task, as they saw it, was to make it happen. That was their job. They set out to do that. And to do that, they wanted to take a hatchet to the foundations of Western civilization. And Marcuse brought one of the tools by which to do this. It's called repressive tolerance or inclusion through exclusion. And it basically goes like this. Here's the, the sort of nutshell summary of the thing. You must include anything that includes everything else. So that which is tolerant must be included. You must exclude, or in our modern parlance, you must de-platform anything that doesn't accept everything else. Now, if you have any life experience or any IQ whatsoever, you will immediately see what's wrong with that proposal. Firstly, it is anti-science. The essential core of science is the vetting of ideas and, in particular, the falsification of ideas. Science works like this. You examine hypotheses and you eliminate what doesn't work. Interestingly, evolution works exactly the same way. It is a ruthless exclusion of anything that does not function well. Now, the entire history of um, Western and civilizational democracy, science, and education have been a process of vetting what does not work and excluding it and accepting only that which remains. The scientific principle is about falsification. If an idea has been falsified, then it is out. It is not admitted back in. The best prevailing idea that has not yet been falsified continues on and is perceived as the standing truth or the accepted idea at the time until falsified. Now, Marcuse goes in the exact opposite direction. It is a tendency to the worst possible idea. Essentially, it takes this notion of vetting the best and puts it aside and says, unless it accepts everything, it's out. Now, you can see how that's anti-science. Let's take an extreme example of this one. And I'm, I'm really overblowing it here, but this is the principle in motion. You have a scientist who comes to a conclusion and you have an astrologer who consulted with her cat's dead spirit and comes to a conclusion. Now, science doesn't accept the astrologer, so science must go. Inclusion through exclusion, repressive tolerance. Now, again, that's an extreme example, but that's the basic principle. Marcuse also proposed that we should flat out ignore the most vetted ideas because they have become embedded. Oh, terrible ideology, embedded ideas. What that actually means is that they have had a thousand years of trial and error and attempts at falsification and they've survived them. So anything that has a good vetted academic or scientific history is a good idea by default. Along comes Marcuse and he says, nope, nope. All is about power and oppression. There's no such thing as good or bad and there is no such thing as qualitatively or factually or logically correct. No, no. Everything is a mask for power. So if an idea is established, vetted, proven by science, that means it's bad. All right. So here we see that you can have science or you can have political correctness, but you can't have both. 
the two are mutually exclusive. So let's take that idea and see how it then plays out in the real world. We've been teaching this crap to kids for the past half century, this idea of inclusion through exclusion and all of that nonsense. And the idea is it's supposed to help those who are not being heard, the, the strange and the radical, to have a platform while pushing aside that which is ideologically embedded, which is to say proven. Now, where does that go in the real world? Okay, last year, Google gets hauled before the US Senate to account for their political bias. This is the biggest search engine in the world. This is where most of humanity goes to get its information. They have been accused of political bias in the information. In other words, they are not giving you scientifically accurate or logically or factually proven ideas. They are giving you things that have a bias toward what they believe politically and ideo ideologically. Now, when you are Google and you are serving humanity its information, that's a serious problem. As part of these proceedings, they ask the Google executives to define fair. This whole thing eventually comes down to sort of hinging on what you mean by the word fair. What is fair play? What is fairness? What is justice to you? And their answer was mind-blowing. It is not what we understand fairness to be. So let's just pause there for a second and ask. If you have a, say a trial, a court case, what do you perceive fairness to be? I think if you think about it long and hard, you will eventually realize that truth is the cornerstone of fairness. You cannot have a fair trial, a fair case, a fair debate, a fair deliberation, any fair outcome in the absence of truth. You have to know what's going on for real. You need the most proven ideas, you need factual accuracy, truth is the bedrock of fairness. Absent truth, things are going to be unfair pretty much by default, by definition. So here's what they said. They said our understanding of fairness is the raising of marginalized voices and the subjugation of voices in power. That's Google's definition of fairness. The people serving information to humanity see fairness that way. It's Herbert Marcuse. It's deplatforming. It's inclusion through exclusion. It's repressive tolerance. They've looked at the information available to the world and they've said, you know, there's something wrong with this information. It's too vetted. It's too ideologically embedded. It is a mask for power. So what we're going to do is we're going to repress the vetted. Those who are entrenched, those who are in power are obviously wrong by default. Now, of course, they may or may not be right or wrong, but the fact is they are not wrong by default by virtue of the fact that they are in power. In fact, that might prove vetted ideas. And people who are marginalized are not right by virtue of the fact that they are seen as a victim class. They may or may not be right in that scenario. Google doesn't care. They look at it as a blanket idea and they say that the privileged, the powerful, those on top of the hierarchy are necessarily wrong. Those who are marginalized are necessarily right. It's Herbert Marcuse. So you can have science or you can have political correctness, but you can't have both. We can also see that you can have justice or you can have political correctness, but you can't have both. And perhaps most importantly and most troublingly, you can have truth or you can have political correctness. But per Herbert Marcuse and the Frankfurt School and his ilk being taught to our kids today, you can't have both. Political correctness does more harm than good. I'm interested in digging deep into where these things come from, uh, figuring out who the ideologues were behind it, unraveling it and showing you how it works today. Now, this is being taught in academia. He is considered one of the fathers of the modern left and of liberal education. And this idea of repressive tolerance suffuses the sociology department. It is anti-science, but they are teaching it. If you know the history of terrible liberal leftist ideas, you can debate them, you can debunk them. That one must go.